Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the IOSH um, Aviation and Aerospace webinar. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Jo, um, one of the Aviation and Aerospace Committee meetings, and I'm delighted to introduce Adam Meredith, who is currently working for the HSC as Pesticide and Enforcement Officer, Team Leader in Bristol. Um, he has been an active member of IOSH for many years and is a former committee member of the Rural Industry, Industry Group. Um, before we commence, we do have a few house rules. Um, this is a recorded session, um, and it will be available later on the um, IOSH YouTube channel. And there will be um, um, an opportunity to ask any questions through the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of the screen. Please use this rather than using the um, chat box. So without further ado, let me hand over to Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, thanks very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak to the uh, AA group. Um, I uh, bitterly head up the team in Bristol as the Pesticides Enforcement Team Leader. So I've got um, five members of the staff working for me. Uh, and uh, across the board, we've got three teams nominally for GB, England, Scotland and Wales. Um, uh, I've been doing this job for a couple of years. Uh, the background of it is that um, uh, it's uh, enshrined in legislation, which I think are coming up on the next slide, uh, which is official controls regulations uh, stemming from a regulation, uh, a European regulation that, that obviously sits there uh, in Europe and we abide by it as part of the Euro exit. So um, I'm not going to be legislation heavy in this presentation, uh, but what you need to know is official controls regulations 2020. Um, one of the things in there which I think your sector's been fairly good at is registering with DEFRA. Uh, but if you need to know about that and uh, you want the link to it, I can put the link in the chat afterwards. But basically, if you uh, cause or permit or you do uh, pesticide storage and use yourselves, um, so even if you use contractors, you'll need to do it, there's a requirement to register with DEFRA which is basically filling in a form, sending it off to them. Uh, they hold the database um, for England and as uh, data agents, effectively, for Scotland and Wales. Um, and they send through to us, and Scotland and Wales send through to us periodic updates of uh, the data um, so that we can see who's registered and who hasn't. Uh, and in terms of um, the way that we go about our work, uh, we do try and identify uh, premises and, and uh, duty holders who, who haven't registered because part and parcel of going out and looking at the, uh, the end user is obviously to make sure that, they're, that they are actually registered. So I understand that since we went out and started looking at users, uh, there has been a significant increase in people uh, registering even though when you look on the website, the time period appears to have closed, but there's there's nothing stopping you registering if you haven't done so. Uh, so below that, sitting below the official controls regs, if you like, are the ones that really apply to um, to authorization, distribution and supply, and critically for yourselves, use. Uh, so the main ones for yourselves to worry about plant protection products, sustainable use regulations, uh, which are really affect end users, um, the storage, um, the competence, the equipment, uh, and the use, um, protecting people in the environment. And uh, there's also a slight overlap with the plant protection products regs, which we normally style as being uh, the, the ones that uh, are for manufacturing, supply, and distribution. Uh, but in in there, for example, just just for yourselves as end users, the uh, the keeping of records of plant protection product use uh, are actually under the 2011 regulations and not the 2012 regulations. Uh, and two documents that 
really need updating, uh, but set as they are, there's a uh, there's what we call the yellow code, uh, which is for the suppliers and manufacturers code of practice available. Uh, if you look on our website, uh, and for yourselves, there's the user guide or the green code, as it's sometimes called, which is uh, clearly marked up on our website as uh, being the uh, the guidance for for users. But uh, today. I thought I'd uh, give you a bit of a spin on that, having uh, been out and about across the country uh, to end users is, well, what, where are we up to with the guidance today and how does that relate to the reality of using it out there in the airport environment? Um, so uh, just to give you a bit more background on where we're up to with, uh, with, with HSE, and uh, pesticides enforcement officer teams. If we can move on to the next slide. Uh, we've got three teams. One is from Russell, York and Bootle. We style ourselves as a national team, really. Uh, we don't have particularly rigid geographical boundaries, but obviously we don't travel further than we, uh, than we have to. Um, if we were fully up to CADA, there would be three team leaders, and 18 pesticides enforcement officers, uh, working to the three team leaders uh, and they're generally out and about a couple of days a week is the aim um, and it's not quite all going out and looking at things because there's a certain amount of planning we make an effort to go to uh, places by appointment uh, and uh, of course for yourselves you know, we absolutely need to do that um, we don't always, and we do drop in on things, and we do get a certain level of uh, complaints and investigations and queries to follow up as well. There's a little bit of reactive work there. Um, but generally speaking, uh, we plan our work um, so that we do amenity, which we would say yourselves fall into, uh, over the summer and we focus back on farming uh, and associated sectors uh, for the winter largely um, because it's not practical to go out and stop um, plant protection products being being sprayed in the middle of a field with tram lines and all the rest of the dependencies on crops and food production uh, and still have an intelligent conversation about the storage use, the record keeping, and the other things that we need to bottom out in order to do, um, you know, full enough visits. Uh, so we have up to now, probably up to about 18 months ago, uh, we majored on suppliers and distributors, of which was a fairly uh, long list of a captive list of people who were pretty much all registered, it would be unusual to find one who hadn't registered under OCR anyway. Uh, and then we're into immunity and the rationale for deciding where we go and why is the um, uh, really to do with uh, it's happening in the public domain, uh, you know, in highways and in reality, up and down streets, uh, parks and gardens and uh, the kind of places that the public have access to. Um, and then obviously when we're into agriculture, horticulture and forestry, uh, we're, we weight it towards direct human food crops, uh, but we will look at other things um, because uh, any, any plant protection product can be get into the water supply and be detected if, uh, you know, if the, if the, if it's not being applied properly or if there's some kind of environmental incident. Uh, so we will look at things, but but generally speaking, uh, with the number of premises that we have in scope to go and look at, uh, we look at the human food chain first. Uh, and if we can move on to the next slide, please. So in terms of amenity sector, uh, just, just as a reminder, I mean, I, I guess you're familiar with the way that HSE and local authorities split their... Um, enforcement activities but we generally historically do things that grow things that manufacture things uh, we do local governments um, and there's a whole list there of the kind of places that we'll go to 
I suppose the maybe it's easier to say what we don't do. We don't do retail, leisure, sport and recreation. Uh, but we, we may do that if uh, it's a golf course owned by a local authority and run by a local authority. Uh, we'll go and look at that because that then comes under uh, local government. Um, just looking at that list that I've got up there of bullet points, uh, it, it is that there is a huge list there. I mean, when you add in the agricultural, forestry, and horticultural premises as well, uh, there's plenty to go out there. And um, even though probably legislation to do with pesticides and uh, you know plant protection regulations and all the rest of it have been around certainly for as long as I've been around. And it was a uh, you know it was part and parcel of what we did as agricultural inspectors back in the 1990s when I first joined HSE. Um, we still go out and find issues and find problems, and so that's why uh, I thought it might be worthwhile talking to yourselves today, because what we're going to go into next with the next slide, please, is the kind of issues that we find. Uh, and I'm going to relate to you, uh, we've been to a limited number of airports, um, and uh, so what I'm telling you is what we've found elsewhere, basically. You don't, don't take this and say, oh, they've been to, uh, they've been to you know, airports and they've found this. I'm telling you for the benefit of uh, you getting your own systems into place, what we've found across the board. And, and they're transportable, really, agriculture, horticulture, but principally, this is from amenity, but I can I can find you the same problems going out there. Uh, and so starting with your management system, because, I, I, you know, going out and finding, it's a bit like doing a risk assessment, really. Uh, you can write a method statement for where everything goes right, and that's all well and good. Uh, but, but what we need to do is look at your method statement and say, right, how can I break this or how can it go wrong? Uh, and your resilience to that happening is to fine tune your management system issues. So if I can have the first bullet point up, please. Um, starting with, you know, it's a requirement in the, in the, in the regulations really to try and minimize your use uh, and to, uh, you know, basically protect humans and the environment as much as you can. Uh, so we, we would be encouraging you to look at the problem ID uh, and identify your solution uh, because your plant protection product selection and your application method need to be considered as well. Uh, so I suppose really it's understanding what you think it is you need to do uh, and how you're going to go about doing it. And uh, I mean, you, you'd probably be aware in, in the immediacy world there are there are all alternative means of um, controlling weeds, basically, which is your problem, I guess. Uh, on airports, uh, we're we're not saying that you you need to go and do that. We you know you, you you need to be aware that those things are there and consider whether they fit the bill for what you want to do. Uh, we would say you know from a from a, an enforcing authority point of view that uh, if it's an authorized product and you're you've got the relevant competencies to do it and you're storing it in the right way. Uh, and you're targeting it in the right way and you're applying it in the right way or in accordance with the label and the regulations, of course, uh, then you can go ahead and do that. Uh, and that's fine. But we, our experience has shown us from visiting already that um, the, 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 there's a, a risk with um, management not having sight of what, what, what's happening in the world of plant protection products. Uh, typically, there can be, uh, you know, it can be a bit of an isolated thing because it's a little bit seasonal. Uh, it's not quite within the remit of safety management, uh, but then it doesn't fit easily with maybe other things like highways and stuff. I'm clearly describing a local authority environment now. Uh, so it's as well to have management oversight over the fact that you've got plant protection products work going on on your premises, on your airport. If we can bring up the next uh, point, please. There we go. So we were talking about uh, plant protection product selection. 
Uh, one of the issues that we found is uh, tank mixing more than one uh, plant protection product uh, and or with adjuvants or other agents uh, that are going to uh, make the plant protection product more effective. Uh, the key thing for tank mixing, and it, it, it goes back to um, your PPP selection as well, is that if you're going to mix more than one uh, plant protection product together, you need to be absolutely sure that you can comply with both labels. And that is going to be both labels in terms of... Uh, uh, so there's a, there's a list of things you can look at on the label, uh, but there's how many times you can apply it in a year or in a season. There's what the target is, and it, it may target the weed that you're trying to control, or it may simply talk about crops. Um, it, it may just talk generally about keeping vegetation down. Uh, one of the key things to look at on the label for um, your own premises really is whether or not hard surface is a specified target area uh, or you know a specified purpose on the label. Uh, and all other things being equal, can you actually comply with both labels if you're going to mix it together? Uh, this is one of the things that's come on in in particular uh, for yourselves with your runways and your areas is you need to be looking at the label to make sure that you can actually apply the plant protection product specifically to hard surfaces because there are phrases, the labels are a little bit of a pick and mix of uh, available phrases for assembling labels uh and uh it, it it's not always straightforward threading your way through the label requirements to make sure that you you are targeting the right the right um weed and targeting the right surface area and that it's all permissible uh, maybe the next bullet point please uh and there we go that that's that's what i've said uh it's some labels will specify the other products that you can mix with uh and that needs yourselves to double check that that's actually taking place uh it's always a good idea to go back to the supplier or if you need to to the authorization holder uh and just clarify with them uh what it is you're proposing to do um, and just just as a note with that as well, and it goes back to PPP selection, uh, you may or may not be aware that um, the supplier will have um, an agronomist. You know, they, they, they have people on hand to advise you if you ask for the advice. Uh, you know, you, if you want to double check anything, basically at the point of sale, then uh, you can you can ask and they will have a competent person, competence in your sector uh, on hand to advise you. You know, it may be a, like a telephone consultation, uh, but I would be uh, I would be encouraging you to do that. In fact, um, experience from all of our officers really uh, has been that we advise local authorities um, to to actually. Uh, before they buy a product to, to check the map number and get the specific label of the product that they're going to buy before they buy it and check a number of things on the label, in particular where you'll probably be familiar that um, uh, you know products may carry the same name, but the map numbers and the labels change over the years. Uh, generically referring to things by the name uh, doesn't really help you within your organization. And this is partly why I'm saying there's a management system issue here. Uh, you need to be paying attention to the specific map number every time you're using a product and every time you're buying it and every time you're talking about it. Uh, and so we would be saying, uh, quote the map number, get the label. And if you've used the product before, check the latest label and make sure that it's all still there and it's still uh, the 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 existing knowledge that you and your operatives had about what the label said uh, needs to be double checked against the new product, um, ideally before you buy it. And then, you know, 
and then you know what you're getting. Uh, because label changes aren't, well, not in my experience, not really flagged up. Um, they change, and the onus is on you as the end user in the regs to make sure that you're following it. So uh, make sure you know what it is you're buying is uh, is my uh, my advice with that. Um, and that, that obviously, as I say, that, that comes in uh, with the competent advice. Thank you for the next point there, which is uh, the... Uh, that's, that's essentially what I'm saying to you. And take the advice if you need it. Uh, and also, um, at the time, take a view, check what the authorization date is and see what the limits are on, uh, on, uh, on the um, authorization as it stands. Uh, because although they are, you know, often, often authorizations are renewed and the product just carries on being sold and used, and that's fine. Um, you need to be aware that there are a certain number of products out there for ease of transportability into the new UK system uh, have a, a notional um, authorization termination date of 2099. Uh, the thing you can say about that is that that, that will change. Um, and you, you, know, you may be getting the bulletins as to... Uh, uh, changes to PPPs and notices about things, authorizations coming to an end, but uh, we would be saying you need to uh, you need to be reviewing your authorization dates for your existing stock, but also I'd be checking it before I bought it. Uh, you know, and there's no harm in asking the supplier. You know, what what's the what's the uh, what's the authorization date for this? Uh, and the other thing as well is to have an idea from your supplier as to um, what the shelf life of the product actually is, you know, irrespective of the authorization date. Uh, because one of the things that we find over and over again is that uh, some products that are, aren't being used that often, um, you know, the, the dilution rates mean that it, it, they can be around for an awful long time for years um, without actually being used up, which is, you know, there's a query then over uh, how long they should be in a store for and still be being used. And also, you know, how much you've bought in the first place. Um, and also you run the risk of them going out of authorization while they're sitting on the shelf. Uh, next point up, please. Thank you. And that neatly brings me into, I'm ahead of myself here all the time, and neatly bring, brings me into uh, stock control, which is, the, 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 uh, for the sake of a, a cell in your Excel spreadsheet of your stock, uh, of your stock list, um, you need to be paying attention to the map number. Keep that in. I'm saying this as, as, as guidance now uh, because it's a means of tracking uh, to make sure that you're not going to be stocking things that have become unauthorized. That that's the that's the main issue we find with stock control is that um, we find unauthorized products in people's stores, and it, it, it's a lack of awareness and it's a lack of attention to detail. Uh, and so we 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 basically give out the advice as best we can uh, to try and influence people. To say, look, you know, you, when you get the product in, record the map number, record the batch number and the date that it was manufactured, uh, because all of those things are good. If there's an environmental or a, or a human incident, it's always good to have that level of detail to refer to. Uh, and then the other thing is, is to pay attention to rotation. And that can be as simple as uh, writing with a marker pen on the bottle when it arrived in the store and then saying to your workers, use the oldest one first uh, or, you know, use the lowest number first. And I know it sounds simple and it sounds like something you shouldn't have to maybe do, but actually uh, the example I would give is you you, you could go to, say, uh, you know, a decent-sized agricultural premises and uh, the, the product's coming in five-litre bottles uh, and the agronomist says habitually for spraying the same area, you know, the same hectareage, uh, you know, for a couple of years, especially, well, actually, 
be, you know, with a with a with a it, actually thinking about vineyards and orchards is where it applies. You're basically saying spraying the same area with the same products year after year. Well, if if you're required to use three point two liters of concentrate to fill your sprayer, uh, then off you go and use it. Uh, if you do that often enough, you can see the temptation on the part of the workers to just pick up another five liter bottle and take 3.2 liters out of that. And that's how you end up with a row of partially filled five liter bottles, the oldest of which may have had a different mark number and gone out of authorization, but the names remain the same. So that that's the, it's as, it's as simple as that really. Uh, and thinking about it, actually, you know, your hard surfaces, they're not changing, are they, in terms of their dimensions? So that, that risk exists for yourselves. Uh, you know, you, you, in, in a way, you have to have some discipline, don't you? Or your workers have to have some discipline to go and start using up partially. It's more mixing for them, isn't it? It's more handling of concentrates because they're going to the older container that's not full, doesn't have enough in it. And then they pour in some out of the new one, and it it sounds it sounds simplistic, but actually, that's literally how you end up with with unauthorized products on your on your shelves, uh, and it's a little bit of stock control, which is why um this bullet points I'm still referring back to your management system. Here we go. If we can have point six, please. So uses records. Now then, recording details, disciplinary recording details. I'm going to have to say, listen. It's the map number. The map number is what you need. If there's an, if there's the reason why you keep the records is so that uh, we can all demonstrate if there's some query in the future uh, about how it was applied, or you know, heaven forbid that it was uh, there's some human aspect to it all. Um, you can go back and you can say on that day. It may be the case that you say on that day we definitely weren't spraying that area. No, it didn't happen. Or you go back and you say, yes, we were doing it, and here are all the details. Here's, here's who did it. Here's his, here's his competency. Um, here's, the, here's the dilution rate we used. Here's the last time it was, it was sprayed. You know, we haven't exceeded the, uh, the seasonal repeat period for spraying, or we only sprayed it once in a year, or whatever the label says for that product. We haven't exceeded the, uh, the maximum dose for the, for the area. And... Um, but the map number will tell you, and we can all agree what the specific formulation of the uh, of that product was with that map number, uh, and we can all refer back to the precise label for what you were using. Uh, and if you could then go back to your stock control as well, and you've got the batch number, the data manufacturer, uh, there can also be comfort to know that there was no, you know, no indication or or product recall or something for it for that uh, that that didn't reach yourselves. Uh, you know, it, 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 the reason why you're keeping the records for three years for usage is for your own benefit. Uh, well, so that's that's your details there. You know, the weather conditions, all the rest of it, uh, the granularity of records. What I mean by that is, um, you need to keep records that describe the geographical location as precisely as you need to be. And, you know, some contractors that I've seen out there, for example, are using GPS trackers. Um, some of them, um, you know, in a local authority area, if you're in highways, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about the roads that they went down or the cul-de-sacs and all the rest of it. But my question always to the person who's in control of PPPs being applied is, uh, can you hand on heart say this this is it it was this area uh, i'm guessing for yourselves your hard surface areas you know they don't move they're they're pretty precise and you've got to be very very precise haven't you about going out onto these areas anyway because of the nature of airports so i'm sure you're all there already um but that's that's the idea can you identify precisely where it was to you know, the sufficient details that you can say, yes, on that day, he did that. Those are the hours that he was working. Uh, there's his competency. And that's the map number of what we were using. And that's the equipment that we were using.
Um, so that's probably enough for usage records. Next one, please. And I think that is, there's an example. Uh, and if we can have one more click in the mouse, please. There we go. Happy days. We've got the map number there. Uh, if I was asked what's mainly missing from uh, from usage records, it's the it's the map number. Uh, and also, sadly, be aware that the reason why I'm saying pay attention to the map number is that quite often as well, the um, the the system, if it's an exit, if it's if it's a spreadsheet, uh, it might pre-fill with the previous map number. That's easy to do. You start off and you put the first three three uh, three digits in, and then it self fills with the old map number. So that's a that's that's a catch that we find. We quite often ask for stock records before we go to premises, uh, and we quite often think, oh, there's an awful lot of out of date products here, but actually. Um, out of authorization products, but actually it's because everybody's using an old map number because that's what's self-filling in the spreadsheet. Uh, but it's the same for your workforce, you know, human factors, they'll think, I know the map number, and they'll write in the old one. So a uh, useful check to make in within your management system when you're reviewing what the records are is you double check the map number on the usage record with the map number for what you think you got in store. But critically, you know, triangulate it with the actual map number on the actual bottle, and then you'll know that you're doing the job right and everybody's happy. Uh, next one, please. And again, that's it. So we're going to seven now. Right. Uh, you may or may not be aware, but you will be aware if you're taking uh, new workers on and training them up, that there are in the number region, I believe, of around about 38 different individual competencies now for specific uh, PPP application equipment and methods. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, everybody needs PA1, um, but then it used to be, well, it's PA2 for a boom sprayer, PA6 for a knapsack, but actually there are an awful lot of other bits of equipment around uh, which is fine because, you know, the, the world develops and technology is developed and the level of sophistication of how we go about uh, uh, applying PPPs has, has developed uh, as as the legislation and the efficiency of doing it uh, with a reducing number of PPPs uh, has become important. Um, but it's just being aware, the reason why I'm putting this in as a bullet point is that uh, there are certain dates when prior to that date, uh, your PA2 um, might have covered you for other other types of applicators or your PA6 might have covered you for uh, um, pesticide plugs or for stem injection or other, what do they, what do they term it as, other other equipment requiring minimal calibration. Uh, if you want to understand uh, exactly what it is your individual worker has uh, in terms of competency, uh, you need to go back to the competency suppliers, you know, the city and guilds and their equivalents, Lantra, um, and say, well, he's got this and he took it in this year. Uh, can you be precise? You know, we, we'd like him to do this application. Can he do it? Uh, are you welcome to get in touch with myself? But I didn't refer to them anyway. Um, so to get the up-to-date picture, uh, go back and ask your uh, ask the uh, the competency uh, approval bodies, uh, or you. I mean, your trainer will be able to tell you as well. Uh, but it's just to be aware. Um, just because it doesn't appear on someone's uh, ID card doesn't mean they're not competent to do it. Uh, but you just need to satisfy yourselves that over the years, the, it's likely that obviously the guys who trained some time ago uh, will have the competency or will be deemed to be competent, uh, but it won't appear as a separate uh, category on their records. Uh, but for newer ones, you know, now nowadays, uh, it'll be clearly identified as an extra category. Uh, you know, and it could be up to kind of 30, 30 odd of those 
So that's just a that's just a flag for you, um, so that you've got that within your management system. Uh, number eight, please. Okay, right. Disposal. I'm talking now. Disposal. If you, oh goodness me, you know, if you have a spillage, you need to clear it up. You need to dispose of it. Um, if you have PPE and you use it, you need to be in disposing of it. Uh, our uh, two things. The discipline is uh, having the guts to dispose of stuff which is unauthorised uh, and not to leave it sitting on the shelf. It, I, it is an offence to have unauthorised products in store anyway, uh, but I, d I don't think that's clear, that's well understood. That, that message doesn't seem to have got out there widely. Uh, but the discipline is about seeing and being honest with yourselves about uh, the likelihood that you're going to actually use up the product that you've got. Because you might want to uh, see if another another airport or another immunity user can use it up. Because if you don't use it up and, it's, and it becomes, you know, the authorization runs out, then you're going to have to pay to get rid of it. Uh, commensurate to the uh, the the volume that you're trying to get rid of, uh, so that's why I'm encouraging you to keep an eye. And uh, uh, I I should say as well that obviously we publish databases on HSC's website. You go and check in there whether things are authorized or not. Generally, the ones that are authorized, they will tell you that um, uh, you know when they're authorized up to. Ones that are subject to notification of change, that's another database. Ones that have been withdrawn um, and aren't subject to anything, they've, they've gone, that's a third database. And you may need to look at all of those three uh, when you find a product in the store. Uh, so there's a discipline there. I, I always advise look at that at least annually, at least annually. But it makes a lot of sense to do that just before you go out and use them at the beginning of the season would be the prime time to do it. But you need to put a note in your calendar to be reviewing the authorization status uh, and be thinking about disposing of it uh, in a legitimate way, um, you know, before it becomes uh, unauthorized. Um, generally speaking, authorizations aren't just withdrawn. Obviously, there's, the first one is it can't be it can't be sold or distributed. Uh, you then get a period of time when it can be kept in store and used. But after that, obviously, then something really is unauthorised. Uh, and the record keeping that I'm talking about in relation to disposal is about um, actually uh, make sure that your waste carrier or the place that, that it goes to itemise exactly what it is that you've got. Uh, because... If you had something in store and it's gone, you need to say, you know, if I had 4.5 litres of this plant protection product uh, and I've got rid of it, you need them to say, we took a container away, had approximately this much in it, and this was what it said on the label, um, so that you don't just get a bland statement. We, we we get occasions where we go out, you know, part of our powers are to, uh, we, we require people to, um, to dispose of this stock uh, sometimes we get unsatisfactory records back uh, in terms of how they've been disposed of, and that opens up another potentially another line of investigation uh, for ourselves or environment agency because uh, we can't match the records to what was disposed of. So, next one, please. Yes, product uses evaluation. So going back to uh, one now because it's management issue and it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit circular, but um, it's uh, it's to do with you know if you think you're using something because it's doing the job, my advice is to keep that effectiveness under review and make sure that it is. You know, if you're buying something to deal with a specific weed or specific circumstances, then you make sure that it's doing the job for you uh, because I think that's uh, that's something that that you should know um, or you're applying it without really knowing why you're doing it. Next one, please. Right, and one last thing, excluding knapsacks and handheld equipment, uh, any kind of 
plant protection products, application equipment is going to need a statutory test under the regulations and the organization that can do this for you is NSTS. So if it's three meter boom or over, it's going to be um, looking at every three years, once it reaches the fifth year after its uh, purchase. Uh, if it's uh, equipment with a boom less than three meters or no boom at all, but it's more than an APSAC, then generally speaking, it needs looking at every six years uh, again after the fifth year. Uh, so NSTS is the key organization. Uh, they have test sites around the country. Uh, they'll generally come to you if it's something like a boom sprayer. Uh, if it's smaller equipment, you can take it to them. Uh, next one, please. Here we go. Storage arrangements. I need to probably major on this. So you'll be aware with your bonding, we're moving on now. Those are the management issues. Uh, bonding now, let's look at the hardware. Uh, your store, you need 100% of the total volume, 185% uh, if you're in an environmentally sensitive area. Uh, risk of compromise and the capacity is, you know, if you store your empty knapsacks in the bottom of the store and it's a cabinet style, then you're compromising the bund because you're using up volume in the bund. So generally speaking, don't store things in the bund saw them on shelves above it and make sure that uh, you're not storing more than 100% of what you can store and leave that margin, uh, depending on whether it's 110% or 185%. It's a good idea to actually have the, um, you know, a lot of people mark the bun capacity there and say you can't, don't store more than X number of litres in this store uh, is, a, is a good way of doing it. Um, the general organization uh, shelves should be impermeable. You can coat shelves. You can, you know, you can coat them with a chemically resistant coating if you want to uh, segregate out flammables uh, by distance. And um, you know, a lot of people will have like a disposal shelf for the stuff that they're getting rid of. If you've got stuff unauthorized out there now and you're waiting to get rid of it, you need to be quarantining it. Uh, in a part of the store so that you don't, uh, you know, don't accidentally, doesn't accidentally get used. Um, think about, uh, as well, I already talked about disposal. Think about the ancillary storage and disposal. Um, you know, make sure the PPE complies with the labor requirements of the PPP um, and uh, how you go about storing and disposing of things. Uh, whether or not you've got the empty containers there in the store, you know, most of them will be triple washed and then disposed of. Um, it'll say on the label as well something about how to dispose of the containers, uh, but organization in how you do it and make sure that what you're doing is secure. Um, goods and discipline. Uh, while I know it's always the case that your workers have got their own PPE and they've got their kit and, you know, and it, it tends to be with the vehicles and all that sort of stuff. We do say, uh, if you've got a store, think about the potential for a delivery to come to the store and actually, um, and actually need to be put in the store when nobody who's actually trained is there, you know, just somebody's there needs to unload the pallet and put it into the store. Uh, our advice is, um, that you have a dedicated spill kit for the store that anybody can use uh, and a dedicated set of PPE, face shield, apron, gloves, uh, something to stick over your boots uh, so that if anybody who's out there doesn't have to go looking for uh, for something to, uh, to do with the spillage, it's there by the store. If there's any PPP outside the store and there's an incident, you can deal with the spillage. Uh, because you've got the kit there. And that actually goes for having the first aid and eye wash there as well. Um, spill materials, some storage and disposal, I've told about that. You know, It's a good idea to have a bin or something because you scrape it up, you scrape up the granules or whatever, you put it in the mats and the granules, you put them in heavy-duty sacks. The last thing you want then is for them to sit around and somehow get damaged afterwards. Um, so, you know, you have a have a have a little bin or something or some area somewhere within the store where you can put stuff that is spilled material that's waiting to go. Um, frost protection is an issue that um, is often overlooked. Um, it will say on the label probably protect from frost. If it does that and you get it frosted, there's no guarantee 
it's going to work and you may have to end up sacrificing the stock. So we would say protect it from frost, you know, a minimal, minimal temperature um, heat source, you know, safe heat source within the store or put the store in, a, in, in an area where you know it's not going to get frosted. Uh, but protect from frost, there we are, label requirements. Uh, and then finally, the, 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 the asset condition is a, is a thing that the store itself needs looking at. You can look at the store and see how it's organized and you can look at the bond and all the rest of it. But we find over and over again that the actual condition of the store, the store can rust away to the point where you can put your fist through the, through the metal work at the back of the bond because nobody's thought of looking at it. It's sitting on the cold concrete. There's no barrier. There's no there's no um, vapor barrier or anything. It, it, it's sitting on the cold concrete, heating up, cooling down, condensation, all the rest of it, rainwater. Uh, we advise put your PPP store into an asset register or some other way of making sure that somebody competent looks at it and says, yes, this is fine. And if that's every five years, or it's every 10 years, that's fine. But when you start to leave it until 20 years, then that's when you start to get a problem. Uh, and of course, if you catch it in time and it's beginning to occur, you can clean it up, you can wash it down, clean it up. You can you can go and do an integrity test and then you can recoat it with a chemically resistant coating. You can prolong the life of your store by putting it in your asset register or your equivalent and making sure it gets looked at. And I think if we get one more press, we'll be able to see uh, what they look like when they're not like. If we can get the next, there we go. You know that, so you can see there, the floor's not good. Uh, the the edge of the uh, of the bond there, you know, it, it's all a bit questionable. That all needs a good clean up. It needs a leak test and it needs recoating with a chemical resistance and coating. And I'll say again, this isn't from an airport. And if we can move on then to the last slide, please, because application equipment, so mixing and dilution, you need to think about where you're actually doing it. Uh, you need to uh, to think about what you're doing it over, uh, whether or not you can do it all at the location of the store, and that's great, uh, or you need to be transporting the concentrates and all the rest of it to uh, off-site or, or elsewhere on the site, and you're doing the dilution there with water containers and all the rest of the stuff. Think about what you're doing at remote sites, uh, take the spill kit with you, take the first aid with you, obviously, um, the PPE and how you do that and whether or not it's worthwhile uh, taking a tray that's big enough to, say, take the knapsack on it as well, do the mixing on it, handle your concentrate, handle your jugs. Certainly when we were trained in PA6, that's how they did it. The chem safe uh, came apart. The lid of the chem safe was effectively a mixing tray. And therefore, you're not potentially contaminating the ground surface with concentrate. Uh, you're keeping it all under control, and you can clean it up and wash it down. And uh, and you know, obviously, uh, that that's a way that's a way of managing it. Um, going on, although knapsacks and handheld equipment don't need the NSTS approval, um, you do in the regs. The professional user, i.e., yourselves need to uh, inspect and calibrate. Uh, even if you're just doing spot treatment with a knapsack, you can go once a year. You can, you know, as a minimum, once a year would be absolutely the minimum. Uh, you can pump it into the jug in a minute and make sure that it's still fit for purpose and doing what it does. And critically as well, record that in your usage records. Or if you want to, you know, there's no harm in writing on the knapsack in a, in a permanent marker when you last calibrated, because you're going to do an awful lot of calibrations at one a year before you run out of space on your knapsack tank. Um, the next one, target area, I'm, I'm hoping that you're all up to speed with, uh, you know, not going near water courses and all the rest of it, because you must be highly organized on the kind of premises that you've got. Uh, whether or not there are emus uh, attached is something else that uh, you can look at on our databases actually um and part three the bullet point three i talked about all, about all of that in the beginning actually uh you know it's the seasonal restrictions it's the potential that you might it might say you only spray once a season um on the label 
um, that you know that especially where you're mixing two two PPPs, one might be seasonally restricted in terms of the number of applications, and the other one isn't. Well, you need to be going for the most restricted one and uh, being in accordance with that. Um, correct nozzle selection height. It, it's a useful thing for you to do with your guys who are doing this is to take them, get them to take you through the label and explain to you why what they're doing is in accordance with the label. Uh, quantity preparation. Um, goodness me, you know, you, like you mix, you mix what you need. Basically, if you're going to, if, Weather conditions change or there's some kind of crisis, then you keep it, but you try and get rid of it and use it up on the target the following day, ideally. Um, it's not permissible to, for example, mix up dilution of PPP for the season once and then use it from a bulk tank. The, you know, none of those things apply. You need to follow the user guide, get everything right, go and use it. And if it can't be used on the day, then you need to use it as quickly as you can. But things that where there's suspension and stuff like that, you know, with certain products, it can't be sitting around in the tank. Uh, it may be something when you're buying the product that you ask the supplier, you know, if I can't use it on the day, how long can it realistically stay in the tank and still be effective? Uh, because then you'll have some comfort to know that you've got a rationale for allowing it to sit overnight and use it the next day. Uh, there we go, washing and cleaning. Have attention to where you're uh, getting rid of the washings on your sites and make sure you don't exceed the maximum dose like that. Uh, and also be aware on the labels, certain, certain plant protection products will have specific cleaning requirements. Uh, you know, including including washing out with specific um, chemicals, uh, and you need to know that because that might either you need to gear up to do the collect cleaning or cleaning of the equipment, or you get the advice in writing from your supplier to say, well, it doesn't apply to what you're doing on airports, or you decide, well, you know what, the cleaning of this, it's not worth a hassle. Uh, we'll use other products. Um, you know, that's what I'm saying. Go back to your workers. When you look at when you look at buying these things, you look at the label and you look at every aspect of aspect of the label and make sure there's nothing in there that you don't get or can't do. And finally, uh, although by definition, I'm hoping you're all going to be on a in a flat area, uh, the general safety considerations also apply. Uh, and it's as basic as you know, no riding along driving a vehicle using the lance by holding it in your hand you can't do that if you want to use the lance you stop and you get off and you go to the target with the lance with the hose that you've got on it uh, but there are just a few general safety considerations there uh, about stability it's transport safety really uh, but it would be wrong of me to say uh, all of this to do with ppps and not draw attention to uh, um the equipment out there because there's all sorts of stuff that we see you know modified equipment self-build uh you know adaptations of existing kit so just keep an eye on the hswa requirements as well and that i think is everything that i want to say if that's okay um Thank you ever so much, Adam, for your in-depth um, presentation. Completely new subject to myself, so it was very interesting, but I'm sure I can apply some of the um, content and other um, health and safety regulations. Um, you'll see that a webinar feedback form should have popped up on your screen, so if you um, could fill that out um, ASAP, that would be much appreciated. Um, I do believe we don't have any questions um, in the Q&A. Um, but if you do have any questions that you have for Adam in the future, I believe he said he'll um, make his email accessible and he'll um, try to respond um, in a prompt, manner, uh, prompt way uh, when he can. So without, unless you've got anything else to add, Adam. No, I'm good, thank you. Sorry, it, it, was, it went on much longer. I was thinking, uh, I didn't think there was that much in it, but when you get into it, it's quite a lot, so... Yeah, absolutely. Um, Email me afterwards. I'm quite happy to field any any queries after the event. 
It's uh, you know, if you can, if it promotes you doing the right thing, that's that's fine by me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to say it. Thank you. And just to um, confirm, this recording will be made available today post this event um, to everybody that's on the call. Okay, then. Thanks ever, ever so much, everybody. Bye now.